everybody. I don't see my own image, but it's all right. Um, so here's the title. I hope everyone can see. Bilinear expansions of lattices of KP tau function that should be function, the permionic approach. So I changed the title a little bit. I think the original title said correlators. And well, maybe you'll see, the, I was in a little bit of discussion with my one of my co-authors about whether to call them correlators or lattices, but I think lattices is more suitable. Anyway, um, so, I'm going to start, let me just uh, advance, I'm going to start out, this is the outline, I'm going to start out by reminding you all, in case you don't know already, what are KP and BKP tau functions, and the main building block example of these things are the Schur functions labeled by partitions, and something also due to Schur called the Schur Q function, which are also labeled by partitions, but the alpha over here is what's called a strict partition. So these are the are both tau functions. In fact, they're the simplest, maybe the simplest example. B tau function Q is a BK function, and every other, uh, as those who work on tau functions, every other tau function is built up by forming linear combinations of sure functions and sure Q functions in the BK case. So just to remind you, what all this will be a quick review of what Young diagrams and what sure functions are. And then I'm going to write down what actually was the topic of my last talk back in March, but it's just going to be a point of a one, one transparency, which is an identity. It's just an identity which uh, is a remarkable identity which expresses for a skew symmetric matrix. It expresses for any submatrix, not necessarily along the diagonal, any square submatrix. It expresses the determinant as a sum over a finite number of products of Fafians, Fafians of the along the diagonal. So the meaning of that is just, uh, you can say it's just pure linear algebra, but there is some deep meaning. It is de deeply related to tau functions because the identity essentially relates uh, two maps. Geometrically, it relates the Plücker map, which embeds an arbitrary Grassmannian into the vector position of an exterior space. Oh, is that, is that Lisa? Or is Lisa here? Yeah. Hi, Lisa. Hi. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's uh, the... The Plücker map embeds in a spiritual way. Um, Grassmannians, as projected varieties, it embeds into the projectionization of the exterior space. And the Carton map does the exact same thing for Grassmannians that are totally maximally isotropic with respect to a, a scalar product. And these two things, of course, are related. And the ordinary Grassmannian is what is underlying uh, the theory of tau functions, as Sato taught us, whereas the isotropic Grassmannian uh, is what underlies the theory of the BKP tau functions. So this determinantal Pfaffian identity, although I won't discuss the geometric content of it this time, it really is at the very root of relating KP and BKP tau functions. Okay, so then I will go to the uh, main tool to represent all of these things, the KP and the KP tail functions, as vacuum expectation values in a fermionic box space of a product of, of uh, operators, which is very simple and which is really the essence of what Sato discovered when he related KP tail functions to Grassmannians. Um, so the fermionic box, of course, is an infinite exterior space because it's commutative, and that is the space, that's the space in which you embed the, the sort of universal grass man. Anyway, so I'll give the uh, fermionic representations of these things, and then finally I'll get to the main uh, punchline of uh, the talk. You'll already see elements of it earlier on, namely, you can define a whole lattice of KP tau functions similar to the Schur functions. The Schur 
functions are labeled by partitions, and partitions really can be thought of, if you're thinking of representation theory, they can be thought of as the weights for some kind of irreducible representation of the general linear group. And the alphas, which are the strict partitions, can also be thought of as weights for representations of the orthogonal group. So this really is a root lattice, but it's not a finite one, it's an infinite root lattice, because the underlying groups are all infinite dimensional. And so we'll define a lattice labeled by partitions, just like this, or labeled by elements of the weights, weight lattice for, um, for uh, A infinity, um, a whole infinite set of uh, K tau functions associated to any given KT tau function, and the same thing for BKP. And then we'll fold these two things onto each other and we'll find that there is a bilinear relationship, maybe not completely surprising when you think how the orthogonal group sits in a general linear group as the uh, fixed point of an automorphism, or an anti automorphism. Uh, but in any case, there is a sort of two to oneness that goes on, and this is well known in the theory of KP and BKP tau functions. So we'll, and then we'll see lots of examples. So that's the outline of the talk. So let's now let's move on. And here in a, a bird's eye view uh, of what exactly a tau function is. So a tau function, a KP tau function, is a function not of one, but of a sequence of flow variables, T1, T2, T3. You can restrict their values to a finite set, but in general, it's a function, and it should be a function thought of as a function of an infinite number of flow variables, which do represent commutative flows on some infinite dimensional phase space. And this is just a gimmick. It's just a, an encoding of all the equations of the hierarchy of uh, KP, uh, the KP hierarchy, into one single, what seems to be one single equation. Of course, this contains an infinity of equations. So what are the variables here? Well, you evaluate your KP. This is the definition, by the way, of the KP tau function. Any function that satisfies this formal residue relation is a KP tau function, and vice versa. I think that's what we mean by it. So delta T, uh, T is, is the independent parameter, the flow variables. Delta T is just a shift. So you evaluate the tau function of two different T and minus delta T, and we can just call that delta. This plays the role of a dummy variable for expansion, uh, for Taylor expansions. And this equation is supposed to be identically satisfied in all powers of all components of delta t. So that's where you get an infinity of uh, variables. Moreover, there's a residue here. This actually is generally a formal residue. You can think of it as an analytic residue by doing a little contour around the origin. But really, you look at this factor, which is the exponential factor, which is delta in all powers of Z. That plays a very fundamental role in KP theory. This is really the abelian group that you're seeing here. Um, and uh, this gives positive powers of Z. If you just form and expand into the series. This, on the other hand, the Z inverse over here is a sequence of uh, one over Z, one over two Z squared. This is standard notation, the square notation. an infinite sequence out of one parameter. And if you ask yourself, where have I seen these before? Well, these are exactly the, uh, the sum ends in the, in the Taylor expansion of the function log of one minus z. Anyway, there, there's a reason for that because of the exponentials. But you just plug that in with a minus sign here. Uh, you do your formal expansions. Uh, if you're very careful, you'll see that there's something that needs a little justification because these are formal negative series here and here, and this is a formal positive series, and the residue is supposed to be the coefficient of the one over z term. But naively looked at, it looks like this gives an infinite sum, which isn't something convergent, but it is not really that because this equation is understood as being satisfied identically in the parameters delta t. So you only have to look at one power of delta, the delta t's, all of them, at a time. And if you fix that power, that fixes the positives. And then you can just match the negatives so that the whole thing adds up to 1 over z. So this does make sense, even though it looks like it involves illegal uh, uh, formal uh, sums multiplying formal series of both positive and negative kind. In fact, it doesn't. Term by term, there's only a finite number of 
terms in each factor. And that gives, it's an infinite number of equations, but each equation only involves a finite number of t variables up to a certain level. And the very first equation, when you expand this out, the first non-trivial equation, is the so-called famous Kaplan set Petrius Lilly equation, which is here. I think I should use the So this is the Kadam set Petrius Lilly equation. Most of you have seen this before. And it is the sort of nucleus of the whole hierarchy. There's an infinity of other equations, but notice that only three variables enter. What we call y, t, and x are really the first t1 variable is x, the t2 variable is y, t3 variable is t. And the quantity of this example is a second logarithmic derivative of the tau function. Now, again, if this, if this uh, sort of jogs something in your primordial memory, it should be, if you can remember <laughs> uh, uh, the study of harmonic oscillators, a harmonic oscillator is solved, the general harmonic oscillator, simple harmonic oscillator is solved using the and the elliptic functions are second derivatives of the uh, Weierstrass sigma function. And that actually, the Weierstrass sigma function is an example of a KP tau function. So this formula with this kind of second logarithmic derivative of the tau function appears over and over again in the theory of the integral system. And it has its roots exactly in the relationship between sigma functions and elliptic functions. Okay, so this is the definition and one example of an infinity of such equations. They're autonomous. There's no um, explicit appearance of the uh, independent variables and, co and coefficients. And they are Complete integral, and that's what the theory is all about. Now I'm going to go to the next uh, slide, which is the analog of this for the BKP hierarchy. That's very similar. Instead of having Z over Z, we have a two, but you'll see that the notation is almost the same. Nota bene that the in exponential is only a sum over odd powers along. So the flow variables for the BKP only uh, coincide with every second second to this flow variable from the point kp. And there is a relationship between the two. In fact, this whole talk is about that relationship. Uh, and we, so uh, otherwise, it's essentially the same structure. This is the Hirota bilinear residue equation defining in the same way as before the uh, BKP hierarchy. In this case, I hadn't written it out in terms of the derivative of the uh, tau function. Instead, I've used the Hirota notation, which allows this to be reduced to an infinite number of finite bilinear equations. If you're not familiar with this notation, I'll just tell you very quickly. Basically, this is derivation with respect to the first variable, six times, three times, uh, the, the third variable is twice with respect to the derivation. So what you do is you, when you define your derivative, you, you take this tau function and evaluate it at t plus delta t, and this one you evaluate t minus delta t. Do the derivations to delta d is set at equal to zero. That's what this Hirota bilinear operator means. And all the equations of both the KP and the VKP hierarchy can be written in this Hirota bilinear form. So this is just to get the definitions. Uh, we won't be using this later on, but everything in this talk consists of function of an infinity of variables which satisfy either one or the other of these infinite set of equations. So the first, the first culprits and the oldest, in a sense, tau function, I guess, um, well, maybe the oldest is the sigma function, uh, but the sure function. So I'll talk about sure function. I'll just say that the sure functions can be thought of either as polynomials in a certain set of variables x1, x2, xn, which could be go to, uh, go to infinity, in which way, in case we call them functions instead of polynomials. And similarly for the sure q functions, they're also polynomials in the uh, in the finite or infinite set of variables. However, they are symmetric polynomials. And for those who've studied McDonald's book or any other uh, source about symmetric polynomials, you know that there are various generating sets and one generating set for the symmetric 
Fibonacci is the power sums. So here we have the power sum. I've written it going to infinity, but it could be finite, and with the normalization factor. So if you identify the KP flow variables with power sums in terms of these auxiliary parameters, then it's perfectly all right to think of the Schur function as a function of these t's because they generate all the symmetric functions and the same and that's what we'll do. We're always going to think of the independent variable as being t or this every second, the odd uh, flow variables. But behind the story, there are these variables in which the functions are not just functions, but in fact are symmetric functions. And that's why we call it bosonic. Okay, so I'm going on very rapidly. I don't want to, uh, to dwell on the background details too much. But if you have a question, please don't hesitate to stop me. I'd rather you'd understand as much of the talk as possible and have very few people understand. I'm going to make one more statement before I again call for questions. Here's a fact. Every KP tau function and this goes back, can be written as a linear combination of sure functions. I will define the sure functions in a minute, but whatever they are, they can be thought of as, as a, a group characters. One way to think of them is characters for irreducible representations of the general linear group, or they could just be thought of as symmetric functions, which are defined by a formula, which goes back, in fact, to Cauchy and to uh, I think but Jacobi really studied them from the, the viewpoint of uh, determinants. Anyway, the coefficients in this expansion are not arbitrary because KP, the tau KP has to satisfy the infinite set of bilinear Hirota equations that we saw before. But these translate, when you put it in this basis, these translate into algebraic quadratic relations for these pi lambdas. And lambdas are labeled also by partitions. Um, and for those who are familiar with Grassmannians, uh, you'll recognize that the partitions play a multiple role. And in particular, it identifies the so called Flickr coordinates, which tell you how you, have embed, how you embed a particular Grassmannian element into the lambdas label exterior elements, and these are the linear co coefficients within the exterior space. So in fact, there are quadratic relations which have to be identically satisfied in order to have um, uh, a point in the image of the Flickr map, and those coincide with the Hirota bilinear relations. They're the same thing. That was Sato's amazing insight. Now, the world which was discovered afterwards uh, by the students of Sato, which applied this to other Lie groups in the algebras, and in particular BKP. So you should think of KP as somehow or other being related to a linear group in infinite dimensions. So the corresponding lattice is the A infinity lattice, whereas B correspond is the corresponding thing for an infinite group, orthogonal group in, in infinite dimensions. And that has something to do with the B infinity root lattice. And the labels here, here the labels are by partitions. Here the labels are sort of by half of this. It's by strict partitions. A partition, as we'll see in a moment, is a weakly decreasing sequence of non-negative integers, whereas a strict partition is a sequence of, uh, of non-negative integers, which can also include zero. So the same thing happens with the BKP tau function as with the KP tau function. They can all be represented as either finite or infinite linear combinations of the sure Q functions. And the fact that the Hirota bilinear relation is satisfied is the set of quadratic relations which were worked out by Carton and are all quite explicitly uh, described in his book on spinners. They have, it has a lot to do with pure spinners, but I won't go into that. So it has to do with isotropic Grassmannians, which are virtually the same thing as pure spinners. Okay, I won't go into that. Okay, so now back to the two basic definitions. But before I go on, I've just been talking for about 10 minutes at 100 miles an hour. 
and I'd like to stop and ask, are there any questions? Everyone is happy and understands everything that's been said? I hope. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to go back. I already said what, uh, quickly what a partition is, and I'm just it's completely decreasing. We can think of it as an infinite sequence if we allow zeros, but if you only allow uh, positive uh, lambdas, then it's a weakly decreasing sequence. Positive the number of them is called the length. It's written L of lambda, but you can, and it's convenient for most purposes that we're going to deal with to complete this sequence at the end of L of lambda any number of zeros that doesn't change what the partition is and the, the uh, weight of the partition is the sum of the non-zero parts okay so that's what it is and it can be represented very effectively by young diagrams i'm sure you most of you have seen this whoops most of you have seen uh, young diagrams before here's an example so here's the partition and the Young diagram consists of uh, sort of a part of a matrix in which you represent the entries by boxes that are horizontally uh, lined and vertically on the left aligned. And the number of boxes in each row is the, are the parts of the partition. So this is the Young diagram for uh, the partition four to one. There's an alternative notation, which is very important. Instead of giving the number of parts, you can do the following. You you do you just it's the same information. You take your partition. You go down to that principal diagonal, and you and you say, okay, if I go to the right, that's an arm. What is the length of that arm? Call that a one. And if I go down, that's a leg, and that call that b one. Clearly, we're going down the diagonal. A one is going to be bigger than the next one, which is a two, and b one will be bigger than b two. So the sequence of A1, A2, et cetera, A1, A2, up to whatever the diagonal number of elements is, which we call R, we call the Frobenius index, uh, the Frobenius rank. So we have uh, R, strictly increasing positive integers. Well, not necessarily positive. It could be zero. If we, if we come to the end, if we have just a box on the diagonal, nothing to the right, and nothing below it, that gives you zeros. So that's also possible. So these strict partitions, which are the so-called Frobenius indices, there's a pair pair of them of equal quantity, uh, and it can go down to zero, and that that is a different part, a strict partition. Okay, so this is all standard stuff. You can look it up in elementary textbooks. Now I'm going to write down the I think the old for sure functions. This was long before group theory was invented. Here's a sure function. Think of it as a function of these variables. I've taken a finite number of bosonic variables, x1 over 2xn, but remember that we can always re-express this in terms of the power signs, and those are the kp flow variables. So here, actually, position is such that when you put a square box x, I think I wrote that already, when you put a square box, you really are writing down, uh, you really are writing down the power signs. The components of the square box are exactly that. Okay, I won't do that in detail, but what the components of this square box is exactly the normalized power signs. Uh, the sure function, where are we? And the sure function can be expressed either in terms of these bosonic variables or in terms of the power and this formula, called the bi-alternate formula of Jacobi, it actually goes back to Cauchy, but it's usually called the Jacobi bi-alternate formula, expresses the Schur function as the ratio of two determinants. But, uh, this is the van der Mond determinant, which has just the monomial powers of uh, xi. So that's an alternate, anything which consists of the same uh, function, I mean, a sequence of function evaluated in different points is called an alternate. So the denominator is the determinant of the van der Mond alternate, and the numerator is an alternate uh, which is determined by the partition. It's also a determinant, only the functions are not just starting from one up to n minus one, 
but it's a selected sequence of powers which correspond to the parts of the partition. And it's pretty elementary to see that although this is a polynomials, it actually is a polynomial because whenever the denominator vanishes, that means two of the x's are equal. Okay? And if two of the x's are equal in the numerator, the numerator vanishes to the same order because it's a determinant. So in fact, the zeros cancel out and this actually is a polynomial. And this is the old There are many others. Now I'm going to move on to the formula. This is going to be a little more complicated, but it really is not more complicated uh, for the Q, for the sure Q function. So here I'm going to introduce something which I didn't do in the previous case. I could have, I could have introduced the so-called elementary and complete symmetric functions, but because the way it is in McDonald's book and it's relevant to the uh, main theorem of today's talk. So take this uh, either infinite or finite product as the generating function. Function n is very easy to see only on the odd power sums. So if you rewrite this as an infinite sum, exponential as an infinite sum over odd powers only, or z, and then expand it as a Taylor series, the coefficients, it's just combinatorial, the coefficients are the so-called elementary q function. Now, this is just a cuisine a cookbook recipe, but this is really what Schur did. You define bilinear combinations of these guys, like this. Sums, uh, sums over products of the QIs, finite number of them. And you notice that, uh, that this is skewed to change the i and j because of the generating function properties. Uh, it is a skew symmetric matrix. So a skew symmetric matrix has not only a determinant, it has a and that's exactly how the Q, how the sure Q function is defined. You take the Fafian of the submatrix, who, who, with the indices given by the parts of these of the strict partition alpha, because an R by R matrix, when where R is the number of alpha, form this Q matrix. It's better it better be even because a Fafian of an odd Q matrix, of course, vanishes because it's a it's really a wedge power. Um, so it better be even, R has to be even for this to be non-zero. And that is what defines the, the sure um, Q function. That looks like a different definition, but in fact, very, very closely related. Okay, now I'm going to cite for you, and I'm gonna leave this behind for a moment. Just for a moment, I'll leave behind KP and BKP and, uh, and uh, and, on. and I'm going to just state for you once again the same matrix identity or determinantal identity that was the subject of my talk four, six months ago before all of this stuff started back in March. Take as an arbitrary, let's say, finite dimensional matrix, an M by N matrix, and pick out R rows and R columns. And with that loss of generality, you can assume that the union of these two is all of n, because the relation I'm going to write down will never go outside of that box. So we can assume that I union j uh, is equal to all of the integers from all What Now I'm going to define the notion of a polarization. The polarization of ij is just another pair of um, subsets of the distinct they don't have to be of the same cardinality. K and L could be different, but they have a property that it not only is the union of K with L the same as the union of I with J, and so in this case, it's all of the integers from one to N, but also the intersections are the same. K intersect L. Sorry, John, I have a, I have a question. I yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry, I, I can't understand how the union, I mean, is R and N related in any way? How can the union be the whole N? Okay. Uh, the, the fact that I've required the, the union to be everything is just a 
But how is it possible if R is no one or two and N is seven? I could have chosen I, I union J as being a subset of, I could have chosen it as being a subset of N, but the relations that I write down never go outside of. No, no, I'm, I'm confused. Therefore, how is it possible? Sorry, John, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm, I'm confused yes. how is it possible. Yes. For example, if R is two and N is 70,000, how can the union of but four elements. But, but, but I'm, I'm putting it into the, I'm putting it into the hypothesis. It is saying the union of I and J is one to N. Okay, and so I, R must this, be at least ten. I, I almost wish I had not written this down. Uh, this is a, this is done in order to make it easier to describe, but it okay. actually puts no constraint whatsoever. If I union J is smaller is a smaller subset of this. Everything I say is never will I need the elements which are outside of I union. Okay, so but they, they don't have to be disjoint, no. I no, of course. Okay. All right. Sorry. Uh, and they're not disjoint. Their intersection is very important. It plays a big role in the formula. Their intersection I call S, but the important thing is that a polarization is only a polarization if it shares not only the union with I and J, but also their intersection with I and J. And that intersection will have a name, we'll call it S. It could be zero and N. Okay? Is that clear, Marco? No, I lost Marco, but here we go. All right, now there's a little lemma, I'm not gonna prove this, but the number of distinct polarizations if you have a combinatorial uh, bent, you can figure this out in your head. The number of distinct polarizations is 2R minus 2S. You can figure why that is. Uh, remember, there are S elements intersecting. We have to subtract those. And then the others, it's only a question of how you distribute between one set of two. And it's also easy to see that the sum of the cardinalities of the two parts of the polarization it has to be the same as the sum of cardinalities of i and j, which is 2r. So that's very little, it can be proved in, in 30 seconds, but I won't do it. Now, I'm introducing something which makes it easy to say the identity. I'm, I'm heading towards an identity. Let me show you the identity. This. Uh, it's this identity here. No, not that, something before. It's this identity here. I'm going to be looking at the determinant of the submatrix of A, whose columns and rows are I and J. And I'm going to express it bilinearly as a sum, a finite sum over products of taphians of the principle lines in which the same rows and columns are chosen, K and K, L and L. So this is the identity that I'm, I'm uh, heading towards. And that is what really was the talk, the subject of my March. But today we're going to be seeing something much more general. We'll see that this is just a very particular degenerate case, a much more general identity of this nature. But before I can write this down, I have to define everything. So there's some numbers. Numbers are clear, two to the power r minus s in the denominator, and the rest is all signs. So I have to define what I mean by the sign of the polarization, KL, and here's a minus one to some integer, and I have to say what that means. So very quickly, here's how you define the signs. You take your, your uh, polarization, KL, and uh, decorate all of the k parts with a plus sign and all of the l parts with a minus sign and the totality of k and l's there are two r of them so in general we're going to have a sequence r plus minus plus minus etc we're going to have a binary sequence of length 2r and what we do is compare this 2r sequence with the one where you are adding the epsilons to the to the i, so you the way that you choose you, the way that you choose the signs that you add to the i's and the j's um, depends on what this polarization is. But there's only one polarization, 
that the property whenever there's a shared element, so whenever there's something in S, then the plus guy goes to the first part and the minus goes to the second part. That you fix once and for all. You never allow a minus to be attached to I or plus to J. It's always the shared elements always take a plus here and a minus. For main elements, which is 2R minus 2S elements, you can arrange in whatever order is necessary in order to make the sequence, this sequence, that you write it with the you want to make this sequence into a permutation of this sequence. And there's only one which has these properties. If you think it through, you'll see that this so that has a sign. That per, that's a permutation of two R elements and has a sign. We call that the sign of K and L. Technical thing, but it really has to do with the way that the computation is done. I'm going to slow down a little bit here because I don't want to lose anyone. Okay, so that is defined. Maybe an example. I want to define what you're just actually. It's coming. Don't, uh, just a little patience, and uh, there will be plenty of examples coming. Very easy examples. So now I have to define a couple more integers. Take, take the intersection of the set i with the set k and call its cardinality pi of k. The same thing for L. And it's very easy to see that the sum of these two have to equal the sum of R and S. Now, now I'm at the formula that I wanted to be at. We take the principal minors with K and K as columns and rows, L and L as columns and rows. If they're Fafians, they're all skew symmetric. These have to be even. That's just part of the thing. It's got to be even because, well, it's just. Uh, Otherwise, the thing vanishes. Now you put a sign of that polarization, and you put another sign, which is minus one to this power, this integer pi l, and half the uh, cardinality of l, which has to be even. So that's a, that's an integer. So this is a sign. This gives you a sign that to put in front of that of the Fafians. There's an overall sign as well, which is universal, and there's a normalization, and this is the identity which I had presented four or five months ago, but which is today going to be generalized in the context of KP and PKP. Now, I want to give an example. Marco, if you want an example, I'm going to give a functional example of this identity. This is just a matrix identity. It relates determinants to Fafians and bilinearity. You know, of course, one instance of this identity, and that is if I to equal j, if you take the same rows and columns, <clears throat> then of course it's all of the numbers from one to n. And this just tells you, and there's only one term in the sum because the polarization only allows choosing either, well, you have to choose k to be i. If j equals i, and k also has to equal i, and l also has to equal i. So this is the famous relation that says that the determinant of a skew, skew matrix is the square of its Fafian. There's only one term of the sum. That's the simplest example that I can give. <clears throat> now here's another family of examples in which there are parameters. So say, I'm going to realize this seemingly algebraic identity in terms of certain functions. And those functions are exactly what we have before. The sure functions. I'm going to parameterize the sure function. Oh, but it's very important that it's at an evaluation point where only the odd KP flow variables are non-zero. So I take my partition, which has alpha and beta as the Frobenius indices. I evaluate the Schur function at this step. E flow variables vanish. And that is a determinant we saw. It was uh, given by the via alternate formula and there are other determinant formulas. Left-hand side is a determinant. The right-hand side, and the mirabilis dictum is that if you just look carefully enough at what these are determinants and Fafians are, you find, with a little bit of uh, hindsight, you find that that identity becomes this relationship 
expressing ordinary Schur functions bilinearly as the sum of the products of Schur Q functions. Now this, I have examples, but this identity is, I claim it's a new identity in general, in the generality that we just saw. However, if you look at Ian McDonald's book, in the exercise, we find two specific cases of this identity spelt out, written out. So this generalizes a result that appears in two examples in McDonald's book. One example is what I just said, namely when is the same as beta. There's a little shift that goes on, which I don't want to go into. But basically, it's when the two when the two uh, quantities that are being polarized are identical. And then you get a special type. It's, it's called actually a double. And in that case, this becomes one term, as I said before. And the sure function becomes the square of the sure Q function for the individual parts alpha, which are the same. That identity you can find in McDonald's book. And there's another one that you can find in McDonald's book. Uh, here, here it is. Um, if we, put, if we define, okay, I said there's a shift. So the double of a stick partition is not really twice the same partition, but shift. Beta, which I won't go into. And the identity which you can find in the long book is this. The sure function for double, evaluated at these odd elements only, is up to the normalization of the sure q function for the single. There's a difference whether it's even odd because this thing is going to vanish if the uh, cardinality of alpha is odd. But if the cardinality of alpha is odd, we can always add a zero. Of course, if there's already a zero there, it's going to vanish because it's the same column. But if you don't, if this does not contain the zero, this becomes this becomes even when when the uh, alpha is odd. And so both of these formulas are valid, and you have whether alpha is of even or odd cardinality, you have the same, the same identity, essentially. Okay, that's doubles. Here's another example that can be found uh, in It's a case where the sum only contains two terms, actually contains four terms, but they're symmetric under, under the interchange of the first term. Oops. They're symmetric under the interchange of the first second. So there are only two distinct terms. It can be written this way or this way because adding a zero to the capital Q means the same thing as evaluating the little Q. So that's just the deal. So for a hook partition, a hook partition, just to remind you, why do we call it a hook? Remember the Frobenius notation here. If there's only rank is one, then we only have one arm and one leg, and that's called a hook. So uh, this is the case I'm looking at here. If you have a hook partition, then you get this four, this two-term identity. And this also is found as an exercise in the book. Displayed before this one, you will not find, I claim anywhere, and we're, well, this is a new discovery, I think. <clears throat> okay, now, what does all that have to do with KP? Okay, uh, we are sort of, well, we're already uh, 40 minutes into the talk. We started five minutes late. Uh, so I'd like to just take a little pause because there's still two parts left. One is, I'm going to now present to you all K and B Dow functions as fermionic vacuum state expectation values of products of um, fermionic operators. And this is part of the standard lore, but I want you to understand it, so I will try to do it as slowly as possible. So, fermionic. Uh, we take a Hilbert space, be a separable, denumerable orthonormal basis, EJ, labeled by the integers, and we take its dual, consisting of the dual basis, with the dual basis. This is just and we form a semi, this is a standard tool, we form a semi-infinite exterior product of this with itself. This is a tool that is standard in 
physics and a few very good mathematicians. And one of them being Andrei Okunkov, who always uses this semi-infinite wedge product space. For those people in the audience who don't know about fermions, I really recommend to you that you should read some elementary introduction. If you want, read Okunkov's introduction, but it's much older than he is. Uh, it's semi-infinite because we work products of the basis elements to the basis, in which all of these are distinct, but we start at some finite point and go to the right only. That's why it's semi-infinite. And the labels for the base elements that come in for a given partition have a specific meaning which is familiar to people who work with um, integrable systems. You think of these as locations in the integer lattice, the real integer lattice, because all of these L's are distinct. And the reason why they're distinct is because they are related to the partition by subtraction and a shift. You subtract j from lambda j. So whereas lambda j is weakly decreasing, when you subtract one more, that becomes strongly decreasing. So this is a strongly decreasing sequence, but there's only a finite number of non-zero lambdas. So eventually this sequence in a finite number of terms is going to saturate. And after that, you'll get every consecutive going downward, every consecutive increase. There's only a finite perturbation of the vacuum state, which is one corresponding to the trivial partition. That in the standard physics uh, language corresponds to the Dirac C, where you have all of the negative states filled up and all of the positive states empty. If the level is zero, we will basically only be using level zero, but there's, you could do this at any level. So that's what this shift is all about. Okay, so now you define all you define exterior multiplication and interior multiplication. And that is the Clifford algebra, that is, that is the generator, linear generators of the Clifford algebra, corresponding to a quadratic form on the sum of the Hilbert space H and its dual, which is defined in the canonical way, namely by dual. You have an automatic quadratic form, and that's exactly what Carton used in his theory of spinners. So, what this is an abbreviated form of the generators of the corresponding Clifford algebra. The so called Fermi creation, which is exterior multiplication by a basis element, or an annihilation operator, which is an interior multiplication by a dual basis element, it satisfies the standard generating relations of Clifford algebra, which are the usual anti commutation relations. And a basis element is labeled by the partition and the section which it is and it's very easy to see that this is the way to construct the basis element you take the vacuum state and you act on it by a finite number of pairs you use the Frobenius indices to label your creation and annihilation operators and there are as many pairs as the, as the Frobenius rank you act on it and it's a very elementary calculation to see that these two are the same thing and this is the basis of everything now I'm going to write down for you the fermionic representation of the most general KP tau form. So we take our zero, zero basis state. So N is chosen. Zero. And then we have a, an abelian group element. I'll define that in a second. This is an abelian subgroup of the general linear group in infinite dimensions with parameters, additive uh, coordinates T. Those are the KP flow parameters. And this is the abelian group that generates the KP flow. Then we multiply that by an arbitrary group, which at least in the connected part can be written as the exponential of an algebra element, which is bilinear of size and psi daggers, with an infinite matrix. And then you could also have U, which we'll see in a minute, which could be a polynomial term or a term which is just monomials in the creation and annihilation of groups. So this is the rest of the definition. You have a product of UIs and BIs where each of these are linear combinations of creation and, well, here's creation and daggers and annihilation operators. Then you have the so called current elements, which are the components, uh, the Fourier components of the current that the, well, I won't go into the terminology, but they're also in the, in the Lie algebra. 
and they're obtained by summing on an infinite sum. This is formal, it always has to be evaluated on some uh, suitably defined states. And this is abelian. So all of these components, this forms an abelian subalgebra of the GL infinity algebra. You exponentiate that and you get an abelian subgroup of the GL infinity group. Do not mistake this for a Carton subgroup. This is not diagonal. This is a shift. This is, uh, this is, this is, uh, uh, well, okay, I won't go into it, but, but it is abelian. They do communicate. Uh, uh, even if it were finite dimensional, this would not be semi simple. It would be nil potent, or it would be at least uh, some, some degree of uh, nil potency. Okay, so that's the AP flow group that adds the flows. And the specific case of this fermionic representation of tau functions is this one, which gives the Schur function. So you can see here's the abelian group element. That tells you the T dependence. And you act on the vacuum these generalization operators, which gives basis state lambda. That's the role of the U's here and the B's. And this formula is very easy to, to uh, basically this formula. Uh, the fact that this gives you the bi alternate formula of Jacobi is purely a matter of applying Wick's, Wick's theorem, which is also known as the Cauchy Binet identity. So here's an example of a fermionic representation of a KP tau function, namely the Schur function. And now I have to switch channels and introduce what are called fermions. These are linear combinations of the things we had before, where you combine positive, positively labeled creation operators with negatively labeled uh, annihilation operators. And actually, there are two classes of these things. So one is with a plus sign, one is with a minus sign, and they mutually, they don't see each other, they mutually anti commute. So the non trivial commutation, oh, sorry, this is a mistake. That should have been zero. Sorry, this should be zero. No, 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 it's correct. This is zero. And the plus plus commutator and the minus minus commutator is non-zero exactly when j is minus k. And it doesn't matter if the plus or the minus is the same. In two invariant subspaces of the Fock, of the fermionic Fock space, one consisting of the span of those elements obtained by acting on the vacuum with the plus operators, with plus index. And similarly, uh, so for every strict partition, we have a state. And this, uh, and we have two types of states, but they're isomorphic, plus and minus. So that defines for you two subspaces of the uh, fermionic phase. Do not make the mistake of thinking that these two are orthogonal. They're not orthogonal to each other. They have a very big intersection, in fact, an infinite intersection. And moreover, they're not homogeneous. They're not just in the n equals zero sector. They have an intersection with every charge sector that is infinite. But they are invariant subspaces under the group. Now, I'm I see 426. So Betty, tell me if I'm wrong, but I believe that that means I have 10 more minutes. Is that correct? Mm, Hello? Yeah, let's try to uh, contain it. In. Yeah, okay. So let's, uh, let's try to finish. Okay. No, I, I think I can finish in five minutes and leave another five, 10 minutes. Sounds good. Anyway, so we also have these subspaces of the original Hilbert space obtained by the analogs and the, the basis elements, which combine the dual elements in the opposite sign. And you can think of a subgroup of, of the full general linear group as the uh, two subgroups, one which acts on this space, and one which acts on this space, which preserves a quadratic form. It's these subspaces which are mutually or These are mutually or This is in the first, this is in the Hilbert, uh, in Hilbert space, not, not the Fox space. And these are mutually orthogonal. And so you have two subgroups which are both infinite ortho special orthogonal uh, subgroups. And the group elements can be written very much like the uh, group elements for general linear, only you have two types, the plus type and the minus type. And you have 
well, the neutral fermion operators, which come in with opposite signs, so I won't go into that. Uh, basically, A is skew matrix. Okay, so now the formula for the BK Teller function, which is completely analogous. We again have a flow group here, which is basically just the odd elements of the previous flow group. We don't sum over everything, we only sum over the odd elements. The current components are made out of the neutral fermions. There are two types of that, just like before. We again have monomial terms in the, uh, in the uh, neutral fermions and a group element of the type I just wrote before. And in particular, uh, I mean, I said this very quickly, but if you take the particular case of this formula, where you just set H equal to, set A equal to the identity element, and you set the U's equal to the product of the phi's, and get the Q sure. So that's the sure Q function, the representatives of BKP tell function. Okay, let's move on. We're we're heading towards the end. Okay. So now I'd like to define a lattice KP tau function, very similar to the Schur functions, but instead of choosing the uh, identity element here, I choose an arbitrary general linear infinite group element here. So I have the flow G and instead of putting the vacuum element here, I put in the basis element given by the partition lambda. So that means that these, this is still a capital function by inspection, it's of the right kind. And if you set, if you set uh, the partition uh, equal to the trivial partition, uh, then uh, this becomes just a vacuum expectation from the exact KPL uh, function called the group element G. And similarly, we define a lattice labeled by uh, strict partitions of BKP tau functions with the same kind of formula. The G is replaced by either H plus or H minus. The lambda basis states are replaced by the round bracket alpha basis states. And the flow variables are replaced by the BKP flow variables, which are only obvious. And it's a well-known 40-year-old result that if you restrict this, if you restrict the corresponding so, where is it? Yeah. If you choose your GL infinity group element to be the product of the plus and minus version of the element that gives you the KP, the BKP tau function, and you square that BKP tau function, lo and behold, you get back the restriction of the associated KP tau function to the odd flow variable. So that's an old result, and my result that I'm presenting today, in which we saw examples of before, is the generalization. So I already defined what polarizations were with respect to subsets i, j, k, l of n. Here I'm referring to strict partitions, but it's essentially the same thing, except that alpha could have a part that's equal to zero, not just one through n. And here is the formula. This is the, the grand formula. I'm going to show it. So this, if you think nothing else from this talk, this formula is the, is the result. Oops. Um, you have this lattice, of KP tau functions labeled by partitions, and of course, all group elements constructed in this special way from uh, multiplying two orthogonal group elements together. So I don't know where the formula is. Yeah, this, this is the formula. So you don't take an arbitrary group element, you take the product of a plus copy of H, which is orthogonal, and a minus copy of H and use that as your group element. And the result is that the corresponding KP tau function, again, just like in all examples, is a sum over products of BKP tau functions, where these are the polarizations 
of the alpha beta that we started with. And the sign factors, everything is exactly the same as in the But now, this is no longer a sure function. It's any BKP tau function, and this is equally valid. So I think I have to finish up, and uh, I'm not going to go through the proof, but it's basically an application of this formula, which is a representation of the basis elements in terms of a product of basis elements of the other two types, and a factorization lemma, which allows you to separate out vacuum expectation values of the products of plus and minus neutral elements. Last example, um, if you set t equal to zero in that formula, you get back the formula that I spoke about at the beginning, namely the determinant of a skew matrix expressed as the sum over products of Paphians of principal minors. If you set the group element equal to identity in the uh, general, you pick up the that we next study where you have sure functions and sure q functions. And finally, if you choose the group element to have a lower triangular, uh, sorry, an upper triangular form, means that it violates the vacuum, then the type of KP tau function you will get, I can't go through the details, but it can be written as a linear combination of a finite number of sure functions. And hence, this is a polynomial. So all polynomial AP tau functions can be obtained in this way by making the specialization of choosing an upper triangular matrix for the uh, in the exponential vacuum. And uh, same thing for the BKP. Uh, I won't go through the details, but uh, that's a subclass where the uh, BKP that you get is a finite number of sure Q functions. And uh, I think I'm going to leave it at that. This, this is the bilinear relation in that case. Here are some references. I think I just finished the time. Uh, the geometry of the thing goes back to Carton, this theory of spinners, isotropic uh, uh, Grassmannians versus pure spinners, the symmetric function theories in McDonald. The background for fermions and for uh, KP and and uh, in these works by Ate Jimbo and company. Um, the algebraic case that I cited and gave a talk about in March is in a joint paper with Ferenc and Jacques Lutubis. There are two more recent papers, one dealing just with the sure function case and the other generalizing it to the arbitrary KP and BKP tau function. And if you want to learn about tau function, here's a little advertisement. There's a book which is coming out hopefully this year, hopefully by December, by Ferenc and myself, which gives a panoramic survey of everything to do with tau function. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's uh, bring the speaker then. Uh, questions. So maybe we have um, time for one or two questions, and after, if there is discussion. Um, yeah, well, maybe I can ask the question. Mm -hmm. you, can you hear me? Yeah. So, uh, that, that's it. Now, as far as I understand, for in the, in the world of um, orthogonal polynomials, for example, right? If you have a matrix model, a BKP tau function would be when the measure of orthogonality is, uh, is, is even. Is that correct? Because then you get the Hankel matrix which is kind of striped, so every the, the odd moments are zero, and then the Hankel determinant actually factors, becomes a square, of the, or, or factors into the product of two determinants. So I think- uh, There is, is that, uh, okay, there, uh, I think you're, I don't want to get into a too specialized discussion, but there is a class of BKP tau functions that can be expressed, as you say, in terms of polynomials, which looks sort of like matrix model representations. I refer you to um, chapter seven of our book, which discusses that. But that is by far not the only BKP tau function. There are many. No, no, of course not. You can't right. express solitons that way. You can't express the theta function solutions. And there are all of these exist for BKP. 
But you're right, there exists and a sort so. of matrix model like multiple integral representation, which involves so then, total topology. But then, then that brings me to the other questions. Like this is famous uh, Kucheva constructions of algebraic solutions of KP. Is there, um, I think we discussed it briefly, right? But I don't know if yes. you have any new insight. Okay. Um, yeah, advertising. I, I presume that there's some students, are there some students present in the audience? Can you identify yourself? You were a student. Okay, I think there was. Students of, I mean, of whom? Of whom, John? Of whom? <laughs> the, I, I, I was mean, a student I, at I some think point. That there were one or two people. I know, but I'm speaking about current students. Uh, <laughs> <I see. laughs> In any case, what Marco is mentioning uh, are two examples. Oh. Well, this isn't a student, but Boris is a postdoc. So, so yeah. two examples of, uh, of application, very general. And indeed, one leads to kind of matrix model type integrals for the VKP tau function. And it would be very interesting to determine what the corresponding lattice of the VKP tau is. a good question, exactly. If you write down the original multiple integral, uh, what happens when you put in these insertions of uh, Fermi creation and annihilation operators? It looks like a sort of discrete Declan or Darboux transformation. And what I should say, okay, I have to say for, since there's at least one algebraic geometer in the audience, Lisa, I don't know if anyone knows, but this is Lisa. Um, what distinguishes the different elements of this lattice of tau functions is from the viewpoint of Grassmannians, they all belong to a different Schubert cell. In a sense, the partition is identifying the Schubert cell. The, the, uh, the only one that is in the big cell is the one where you have the vacuum expectation value. But when you take the lambda state expectation value, you immediately move into the cell corresponding to that partition. So one can do this for any class of BKP or KP tau functions. You can start out with something in the big cell and then lattice-size it, which really means putting it into these Schubert cells. And ask yourself, well, what, what, what is it? Is this also representable by a multiple integral? Or in the case of Kritschuber, uh, Novikov type solutions, is it representable? I suspect it is, but I haven't worked it out. In terms of the function or in terms of uh, something more general on print varieties or something like that, or possibly with characteristics. So all of what's for sure is that in the theta function case, Marco, this is addressed to your question. In the theta functions case, when you put in these non-vacuum states on the right, you're off, you're going on to the theta divide. You're going out of the, the big cell, which is a complement yeah. of the theta divisor. And you're going on to, but this theta divisor is stratified. And that's this cellular structure, which is in Grassmannian. So in fact, there's a lot of work to be done to analyze really what kind of solutions there are when you restrict yourself to one or another uh, strand in the theta divisor. Does that answer your question? Well, it goes towards the answer. Let's put it this way. <laughs> okay, by the way, in this work, I, I also wanted to include solitons. And it's easy. I mean, it's easy to write down the BKP multi soliton solution, which has a very special class of associated KP solitons. Oh, um, by the way, is there is there any connection with total positivity and like the words of... Um, you know, the, the uh, Japanese culture. <laughs> I'm sure there's Kodama. a connection. Kodama, uh, right? I'm sure yeah. there's a connection, but I haven't considered it. I can't say anything. That has to do with singularities. You want to avoid singularities. And move exactly. And, right. Uh, really, we, uh, we have that. Uh, do you, do you have any plots? Any plots of those solitudes? Any plots? Uh, well, I wouldn't, let's say, let me be very optimistic. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, there's a similar analysis of non-singular solutions in particular. Uh, uh, which, well, I don't know. 
frankly, when you go into lower cells, you're always at risk of introducing the zero of the uh, tau function, and that means you're off the big cell. Does that mean it's a singularity? Yes, the zeros of tau function, yes. Normal vanishing points for the tau function. So uh, you could probably do a stratified, I, I don't know, I, I think this is really deep stuff. You could probably do a stratified analysis and say, okay, when we restrict ourselves to, let's say, a lower stratum, then we definitely are putting in some kind of singularity, but they can arrange that as just this one singularity and everything else is regular. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't really want to say something about that. I see no other questions. So in this case, I, I thank you very much, John. It was a very interesting talk. And, uh, okay. and uh, let's uh, thank the speaker all together. And we'll see you uh, next week.